Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. As you may know, at Rich Planet, we don't like to report on stories that are creations of mainstream media, because inevitably they turn out to be either false or pushed for an ulterior motive. One mainstream story that has featured heavily over the last seven years is the so-called phone hacking scandal. Let's correct that straight off and give it its proper name, the phone hacking PSYOP. It was not a scandal, it was a carefully orchestrated pantomime, a psychological operation created for a specific purpose. Today, I am going to refocus this phony bone of contention and shine the spotlight onto the questions that this PSYOP was set up to hide. But before I do that, a quick bit of background. Phone hacking usually consists of obtaining somebody's mobile phone number and possibly their password, but that's not always necessary, then retrieving and listening to that person's messages remotely without having access to their actual phone. In some cases, it involves recording live telephone calls made by that person. With a mobile, this would normally require some help from a phone company or an intelligence agency. It's well known that people working for mainstream newspapers have been using such techniques to gather information on thousands of people going back to the 1990s, mainly to gather information on celebrities who they like to write stories about. Why bother to get off your arse to find out information when you can just hack someone's phone from your office? Up to 2011, the practice of phone hacking had been reported in mainstream media many times, with various people being named and arrested for such offences. The other thing to point out is there was, and perhaps still is, a relationship between those doing the hacking and the police. Hackers share information with the police about what they have retrieved and recorded, and in return the hackers get tip-offs on criminal cases. The hackers and the police both benefit from these activities and the police do not usually pursue hackers for their crimes. It wasn't until July 2011, and I am sure some of you remember the birth of the so-called hacking scandal, which started on the 5th of July that year, initially with stories claiming that the phone of murdered schoolgirl Millie Dowler had been hacked nine years previously, back in 2002. More phone hacking scandal stories followed the day after, then more the day after that, and we were then told that these stories were so scandalous that the news of the world had decided to close down its newspaper. If you believe this sequence of events on face value, you are as green as the grass at Wembley Stadium. Out of all the people who have had their phones hacked, the case which was central to the whole PSYOP was that of Millie Dowler. The Dowlers were the first people to be interviewed by the Leveson Inquiry. The Dowlers were one of the few non-celebrity cases being investigated by Leveson. But more importantly, the phone hacking scandal had its kickoff time just a few days after the trial of Millie Dowler's killer had come to an end, despite the actual so-called hacking taking place in 2002. So just to recap, the Dowler case is the first case being exposed in the 2011 phone hacking scandals. It was the first case presented at Leveson and the media scandal commenced immediately after the Millie Dowler trial. But why? Why did the phone hacking issue, which had been going on for years, suddenly become the most important thing on the planet, when it was common knowledge that phone hacking was happening? Why were these fairly minor crimes being blown out of all proportion and turned into a media circus? I think the answer lies in the detail of the case of Millie Dowler. The phone hacking so-called scandal was a PSYOP and the purpose of this PSYOP, in my opinion now, is directly connected to the Millie Dowler case. I ascertained in 2011 that this so-called scandal was a PSYOP and at that time, 2011, I thought it was a smokescreen for 7-7. Here is a clip of me talking in 2011. 
So let's look at the timing of these events, okay? Here's the headlines from the 5th of July. So some of the papers have started on the phone hacking, where well, they call it a scandal, listening to people's telephone messages. That's what it is. Listening to messages that people have left, okay? Now, we've got the Independent, News of the World hacked Millie Dowler's phone. We've got the Guardian, News of the World hacked Millie Dowler's phone, and I think there's one other. So there's three papers there, and it's specifically the Millie Dowler case. Okay, so it's in the media, but it's not, it's not blown up quite yet. The following day on the 6th of July, July oh, we now find that the, that, um, the media have hacked um, is it Jessica and Holly, the, the Soham uh, girls that were murdered, hack their uh, parents' phones. And this is now in the Express, it's in the Mail, we've got it in the Mirror. The majority of the papers have all got this. And then we find on the 7th, w when the story was at its height, it's in all the papers. Oh, and now we've got Madeleine McCann. No, so we've got Millie Dowler, then the Soham, then Madeleine McCann, their parents. Were. To me, this is just trying to pull at people's heartstrings, these stories. <coughs> they may be true, um, but I believe that they've been placed in the media at this time for a very specific purpose. And then, on the 8th, this is when the story broke that the news of the world had decided it was going to close because of this so-called scandal. We've got here, um, Murdoch sacrifices his toxic tabloid to save the empire. Um, uh, shut in shame, the Daily Express. So this was the first time in, on, in newspapers that reported that they were going to close the news of the world. Now in a story in the Telegraph, this broke late on the 7th. Okay, and it says that the news of the world, how soon before the sun on Sunday arises. So uh, they were talking about there's going to be a replacement newspaper called The Sun on Sunday. And this was in our media late, as I say, late on the 7th. So obviously, if you're setting up a new newspaper, you need to buy an internet domain name. You need the domain name for that newspaper, thesunonsunday.com, thesunonsunday.co.uk. Now, if you check the who is register on the internet as to when those domain names were registered. This is uh, the sunonsunday.co.uk and also the sunonsunday.com. They were registered by News International on the 5th of July. So this is like really before this story had got going in the mainstream media. And I would suggest that if it's registered on the 5th of July, the decision to buy those domain names and launch that replacement newspaper has been made before the 5th of July, before the phone hacking story was even in the media. So I would read from that, that that Murdoch has known that there's going to be this sequence of, of different people whose phones have been hacked, and then he's going to close that organization. So f for, for me, and it's just my opinion, I believe he's partly orchestrated that story himself. In order to explain why I now believe the whole phone hacking psyop was orchestrated because of the Millie Dowler case, I need to go through some key elements of the investigation. There is quite a lot of information in this book, written by Millie Dowler's sister, about the events following the disappearance. There are also a few elements in this book which I believe are being economic with the truth. Seems to me the publishers were probably in the pocket of those running the PSYOP. I'd have a lot more faith in this book, as with any book, if it had been self-published. So just to summarise in short a time as possible, March 2002, 13-year-old Millie Dowler is on her way home from school in Walton-on-Thames. She gets off a train with friends, then starts to walk the last half-mile home by herself. She does not return home and is not seen again until her remains are discovered six months later in Minley Woods, 20 miles west from where she was last seen. When she doesn't return home, her friends and family are ringing her repeatedly, leaving messages for her to contact home. By the following day, her phone's mailbox is full, so it is no longer possible to leave messages. The family repeatedly call her phone, despite not being able to leave messages. Then, two days later, when Millie's mother calls the phone, the mailbox is now allowing a message to be left. The mother thinks this could mean that Millie is alive, because the messages must have been retrieved. 
it does not dawn on the mother that somebody else other than Millie could have access to the messages, and the Dowlers don't consider this possibility for another nine years. Having researched this, it is my belief that nobody deleted any messages. I believe the News of the World obtained Millie Dowler's phone number, listened to and recorded and transcribed all the messages. They then contacted Surrey Police and told the police they had messages and shared those messages with the police. News of the World even ran a story which featured the content of one of the messages. This must have been done with the approval of the police. I won't go into that actual message here. Just to say that I don't believe any phone message evidence was actually lost in this case. I also doubt that any of the messages contained evidential value. I have looked into the possibility that Millie Dowler's killer, who I will come on to, may have known her previous to the abduction and contacted her on her mobile beforehand, but I have not found any evidence to support that. In my opinion, it does look like a random attack so I do not think there was any important evidence within the mailbox of Millie Dowler's phone, and I suspect the police were given transcripts of all the messages anyway. Therefore, the only negative aspects of this were that the Dowler family were given false hope when the mailbox was emptied, and second, that private messages, which should remain private, were listened to by journalists. Apart from that, I don't believe the police investigation was hampered at all by the phone being hacked. So now you can see that the phone hacking so-called scandal, this being the jewel in the crown of the hacking cases, was being blown up out of all proportion. But it was being blown up for a reason. The person who, nine years later, was eventually convicted of killing her, nightclub bouncer Levi Belfield, lived just yards away from the place she was last seen. He was also well known to the police. In the two years before she was taken, Belfield was reported to the police 93 times for alleged indecent assaults, obscene phone calls and physical assaults. His partner, who he was living with, had four months earlier come out of a woman's refuge, which she went to for protection against him. After the disappearance of Millie, the block of flats where Belfield and his partner were living, Collingwood Place, was investigated by police. But number 24, their flat, was the only flat that police did not actually speak to anyone at. Belfield insisted that they moved from this flat not long after the time Millie Dowler disappeared. It seems to me from reading Dowler's book that the police in their investigation were pursuing only two main lines of inquiry. The first was that she had willingly ran away from home, possibly with a boyfriend. Second was that Millie Dowler's father had murdered her. The book is extremely critical of the police investigation for not pursuing the correct line of inquiry, which was that she had been abducted against her will. Hence the Dowlers seem to think the reason for the police not getting a conviction for nine years was down to merely police incompetence. But I beg to differ. From the evidence, I suggest the police should have had Belfield as a suspect from day one. Surely some elementary research on day one would have thrown up his name as a suspect. I am very doubtful that someone within the police service did not know Belfield could be Dowler's abductor from the start. So this leads to the possibility that Belfield was being protected by the police. Perhaps it was not incompetence, but deliberate perversion of justice by actively protecting the perpetrator. Certainly in the earlier years of the investigation, we can ask the question, was Belfield being protected by the police? When you throw into the pot more facts, the possibility of the police having knowledge of Belfield's possible involvement grows further, starting with the fact that Belfield was a police informer. It is well known that police informers are well protected and usually paid by the police. If they are a good asset, the police will allow them to continue in their crimes, often drug crime, which is one of the crimes Belfield was involved with. 
This article, written in 2011, states, His usefulness to the Met was last night feared to be one reason the child sex monster and serial rapist dodged justice for so long. Let me repeat that. His usefulness to the Met was last night feared to be one reason the child sex monster and serial rapist dodged justice for so long. But all along the maniac was registered with Met Cops in Ealing, West London, as a covert human intelligence source. Let me repeat that, a covert human intelligence source. Add into the mix that Belfield was also known to offer men that he knew access to have sex with underage girls. In other words, he was acting as a pimp for underage prostitutes. If Belfield knew the identities of men who had had sex with underage girls, that could give him considerable power over them. Bear in mind that at his paedophile parties, he is alleged to have filmed men having sex with underage girls who had been drugged with GHB. This story from 2005 explains how two Surrey police officers were jailed for a catalogue of inappropriate behaviour and having on-duty sex with teenage drunken women they had been called to help. Did they know Levi Belfield? Were Surrey police having a clear out before allowing Belfield to be named as a suspect? The whole story about how Belfield eventually did become a suspect in the Millie Dowler case also seems very fishy. Apparently, he was being investigated by the Met Police for other murders, and they decided to examine all his previous addresses for evidence. Were they looking for videos, I wonder? One of these addresses was 24 Collingwood Place, where he was living when Millie Dowler disappeared. The police sealed off the flat and put up police tape, which then alerted the Dowler family to something being investigated at that place. When Millie Dowler's mother saw the police tape at the very place Millie was last seen, she was convinced the police were investigating the murder of her daughter. But this was not the case. They were investigating other murders that Belfield was eventually convicted for. So it was as if the Met Police stumbled across the Dowler killer by accident, a killer that Surrey Police had been allegedly looking for for years. Belfield was known to lust after young underage girls in school uniforms. Millie Dowler was in a school uniform, she had long legs and was wearing a short skirt, so it would appear that the murder of Millie Dowler was probably sexually motivated. There are other indications, which I won't go into here, why this may have been the case. However, his other murders, which followed the Dowler murder, seem rather different. They are summarised by this quote from the book The Bus Stop Killer. There were no witnesses to any of the attacks, no evidence directly linking Belfield to the women, no forensic evidence to put him at the sites, no DNA evidence saying he had been present, no CCTV footage of the attacks themselves, no murder weapon in two of the cases, and perhaps most significant of all, no clear motive. Why had Belfield decided to attack these five innocent young women whom he did not know without warning and for no apparent reason? These murders almost sound like they could be contract killings. They are not the result of lust, like with the Millie Dowler murder. I've racked my brains over this, and thinking aloud, was Belfield blackmailed to commit these subsequent murders by someone who knew of his role in the Dowler murder? Was there a motive which connects all these girls to have them murdered? Anyone with any thoughts on this, please get in touch. The reason, ostensibly, it took so long to prosecute Levi Belfield for the murder of Millie Dowler is because the Met Police wanted to finish their investigations and trials for his other murders before they would let Surrey Police start their interrogation of Levi Belfield. So it was kind of a we found him first scenario, despite the fact Millie Dowler's murder occurred first. Would it not have been more logical to try him in the order that the murders occurred. Eventually, Belfield's Dowler trial was due to start in early 2011, 
And just as preparations were being made to start the trial, remember, at this point, the family have no idea anyone has hacked Millie Dowler's phone. The family are invited to a meeting to be given some disclosures about Millie's phone being hacked. Bear in mind this meeting is not with officers who are involved in their case. It is officers from London who are running Operation Wheating, the investigation into phone hacking. They are sat down and told in dramatic fashion that the News of the World hacked Millie's phone and are then shown pages from the notes of Glenn Mulcair, one of the hackers who has taken a lot of blame for the phone hacking scandal. It's been said by those in the know that Mulcair is very much a patsy in the whole hacking expose. The thousands of pages of Glenn Mulcair's notes seized by police feature heavily at the Leveson inquiry, which allegedly detailed who he hacked and when. However, at this meeting, the Dowlers asked for copies of Mulcair's notes pertaining to the hacking of Millie's phone, and the police refused to give them copies. I am not aware that Mulcair's famous hacking notes are available for public scrutiny. It seems they flashed these notes at the various phone hacking victims, but would not allow them to take copies. If they are not available to view, then I question the veracity of those notes. I am not suggesting there was no hacking, but I am suggesting Mulcair is just a whipping boy, the notes being a prop or a pre-agreed disclosure, all done to protect others. So we can ask the question, why? Why or why? Why at that time were the Dowlers told about the hacking? I don't believe for one second it was because the police thought they had a duty to report this. I suspect the police were very worried just before the Millie Dowler Belfield trial that information was going to come out at the trial and become publicly known that would not just question the police's competence as the Dowlers have done but would question whether Belfield was protected by police in the earlier stages of their investigation. Because if he was, it means the police were responsible for at least two further deaths since Millie Dowlers. I suspect around late 2010 and early 2011, when the Belfield trial was being prepared, the police consulted a PR agency or an intelligence agency an agency to advise them on how to protect their reputation against the possibility of people suspecting that they, the police, protected someone who turned out to be the killer of three young women and possibly more. How could they do something to avert the damage that might follow the trial? I suspect the agency that may have helped the police came up with a corker. We need a scandal to take people's attention off Belfield. Something connected to Millie. Something controversial, which can be blown up out of all proportion. Something we can call a scandal. Something that can also include celebrities who will provide even more distraction. What about a phone hacking scandal? If we tell the family that Millie's phone was hacked, we can then steer their energy into complaining about that, rather than asking questions about Belfield. We can then claim that the scandal is so great that the news of the world has to close. Hang on, we need the permission of the owner of the news of the world if we're going to do that. Yes, I suspect that the news of the world knew as early as January 2011 it was going to go along with accepting the blame for the phone hacking scandal and close. This might offer a clue as to which PR firm was involved in dreaming up the phone hacking psyop. Any suggestions, folks? Someone who runs a successful PR firm that is linked to the Murdoch empire? As soon as the Millie Dowler trial finished, the phone hacking psyop was put into full swing. In my opinion, all the main players in the phone hacking pantomime are state assets. Leveson himself, David Sherborne, Robert J, MP Tom Watson, David Cameron, and I suspect the Dowler's own solicitor, Mark Lewis, is also a state asset who managed to get the Dowler's private meetings with the Prime Minister David Cameron, then with Rupert Murdoch, 
with Hugh Grant, Nick Clegg, etc., etc. Note that the reason why the Dowlers were given access to the Prime Minister and Rupert Murdoch was not because of their immense distrust and dismay at the police investigation into their daughter's murder. It was ostensibly because their daughter's phone had been hacked. The Leveson inquiry was carried out, I believe, by state actors I have just named, who were all paid handsomely for playing their parts. If you don't think that Rupert Murdoch was a witting actor in this nonsense scandal, just watch this clip and tell me he isn't acting. It's a matter of great regret of mine, my father's, and everyone at News Corporation. And these are standards, these, these actions do not live up to the standards that our company aspires to everywhere around the world. And it is our determination to both put things right, make sure these things don't happen again, and to be the company that I know we have always aspired to be. As for my comments, Mr. Chairman, and my statement, which I believe was around the closure uh, of the News of the World newspaper. Before you get to that, I would just like to say one sentence. This is the most humble day of my life. The only people who were not actors were the Dowlers, and ironically, the unwitting celebrities, many of whom are actual actors, who played their parts in the Leveson pantomime, helping to create a massive diversion from serious police corruption. It was hilarious to see the likes of Steve Coogan believing he was taking part in a genuine inquiry. Aha! Stick to comedy, Steve. If you had attended the Leveson inquiry as Alan, I might have more respect for you. Ah, uh, could I have a hot egg and a crescent of crisps, please? The fact that the Leveson recommendations were never implemented is confirmation that it was just a pantomime. Aha! A pantomime for the purposes of diversion. Aha! If you want phone hacking to end, you don't need Leveson. You just need the police to do their job properly. Of course, the hackers need to be dealt with in courts of law for crimes they committed and are committing. But you don't need a Leveson inquiry to do that. The next people on trial should be the police for not stopping the phone hacking in the first place. But Leveson hardly went near the police. Just putting that aside for now because we need to concentrate on the real issue here. The real issue behind the whole phone hacking nonsense which is the possible protection of Levi Belfield. Which police officers was Levi Belfield informing to? Who was Levi Belfield's handler? What intelligence was gathered from his disclosures? Was he protected by the police? Was he doing the police favours because of what the police knew about his involvement in the Millie Dowler murder? This is where the spotlight should be and Leveson was concocted, in my opinion, to move the spotlight away from these questions. After his arrest in 2004, Belfield is alleged to have, before that time, called the Met Police 81 times. What were those phone calls about? Were there officers in the Met or Surrey Police that, for some reason, could not afford to allow Belfield to be arrested in 2002? Was he just too close to the police to be arrested for some reason? In the phone hacking scandal, the news of the world was used as a convenient black hole for much of the phone hacking blame to be flushed down. They didn't want any real fallout from this because it wasn't a real scandal. Now if all you are doing is going after the news of the world and no one else with this issue, then you are aiding and assisting the phone hacking psychological operation. A psychological operation which may have been concocted to bury police corruption. I agree that the media are the scum of the earth. I agree that phone hacking is illegal and should be dealt with. But in this case, the news of the world were used to facilitate a diversion. A diversion from something infinitely more serious than phone hacking. I believe a new ITV drama about the Millie Dowler case has been produced. If you are unfortunate enough to watch it, just bear in mind what I have said here and see if that drama mentions the fact that Levi Belfield was an important police informer.
See if it exposes what he was informing about and which officers he was informing to. Anyone with information about Levi Belfield or on his relationship with the police, please get in touch. That is what people should be talking about, not the phone hacking. Whoever controls the police need to stop protecting the police like they did with the dead cop murder psyop. That's the only way the police can improve. I am not against the police. I am for having a strong police force. But whenever it goes wrong, we need to have it out in the open so people can see it is corrected and therefore trust it. Those who run these cover-ups, do you really fear so much that the public will turn against the police to the point of civil unrest? I don't believe that would happen. The more transparent you are in the long run, the more respect people will have for the police. It might mean people learning some very painful truths, but in the end, they will respect the system only if it is transparent. You have to stop concealing police mistakes and corruption, even if it has resulted in the murder of young girls. I believe there are a number of people, both in alternative media and in the mainstream media, who are today still assisting the phone hacking psychological operation which I have just laid out. I urge everyone to research Levi Belfield and the Dowler case before getting upset about who recorded or listened to a message on someone's phone 16 years ago.